Welcome to the Trader's Mindset and Emotional Management video series. In this video, we're going to discuss building a robust psychological framework. As traders, one of the first things we have to accept is we're all humans ruled by emotions. No matter what we do, we're always going to feel some sort of fear, some sort of greed. Whatever it is, we're human. We're going to feel it. It's natural to feel that. But as traders, we shouldn't try to escape those emotions. Instead, we should seek to understand our emotions and find out how can we better deal with them as traders. And one of the most common emotions is a lot of people, they're afraid of losing money. They, you know, they just have a fear of losing. They, they have a hard time dealing with uncertainty. And that fear, it leads a lot of new traders to believing it's all about finding that perfect technique or that perfect strategy that's just going to make them a bunch of money and they're going to become a very wealthy trader one day just off that one perfect technique or that one perfect strategy. However, no one is really preparing them for the fact that it's not technique or strategy that will set them apart from other traders. More often than not, at least from all the traders that I've spoken to, oh, well over 100, they're not losing money over time because they don't know enough about technical analysis or the markets as a whole. They lose money because they refuse to accept what is right in front of us. Therefore, most of the time, it's not the market beating them, but they're beating themselves. Part of the reason for that is they have the wrong focus. Some of the questions that they might ask is they might be asking, well, how do I trade options? How do I trade stocks? How do I trade futures? How do I trade crypto, etc.? Or how do I trade with the perfect indicator? Indicators, they, like, like when, when I reference indicators, when I say this, I'm not saying like indicators are bad. I'm more so referencing, referencing it towards the person that thinks that indicators or there's some holy girl indicator just constantly putting new indicators on the chart because yeah, the other one isn't working, they, it's not working, whatever it is. It, it, these, in that case, an indicator can just be a distortion of price. So therefore, if that trader overly focuses on a specific indicator to say, this is what's going to make me a bunch of money, it's going to skew that thinking to what the price and volume is actually telling us. So what happens here is when, as traders start going down this loop of just constantly just trying to find like that perfect strategy or just constantly trying to find that perfect indicator, it leads through a cycle where they, this trader, they might experience a period of trading well for a period of time using that indicator or strategy. Maybe they had like a lucky windfall or something and they're happy. They think that they know something. That's just being human. Usually when we work hard at something, we think our hard work will continue to be rewarded. But then in the market, when, that, when it stops being so giving, we lose money, our discipline might weaken, we get frustrated, and we seek more education. Then we do well again, we lose money again, then we stop, sometimes for a while, sometimes forever. And this leads to new traders just in a never-ending cycle of education looking for the next new edge. Well, why is that? It's not that the indicator or strategy stopped working, maybe it did, but more likely than not, it just stopped working for that period of time. And later on, at, when certain variables align, it might start working again. And most people don't understand that. But what's actually happening here is 90% 90, 90 of these traders, they do not know how to lose. The emotions they experience when they lose cause them to act in a way that's not in their own best interest. And because traders don't know how to lose, one of the fastest ways to improve our trading is to start being mindful of our behaviors. So like understand what's really going on. So for every hour you spend on learning about that new edge strategy or indicator, you must set aside at least 50% of that time self-reflecting, really understanding like what are your weaknesses? You wanna understand what are your strengths? You have to understand what you're good at and what you're not. And then you have to begin to build a set of trading rules to follow that. And this will be covered more in the trading in mindset video in the upcoming videos but you really have to like every time you learn like some new technical pattern or some new strategy just really start saying hey when do I trade this well when do I not trade it well when does the market offer a really good opportunity when doesn't the market offer a really good opportunity when does this not work when does it work really well when is it when is it like a clean trade when is it like a little bit choppy things like that you, know, you really just want to be thinking through and reflecting on the information that you're learning because if you don't spend time improving these things, how will you get better? What gets measured gets managed. Very few traders will engage in this level of self-reflection in order to gain the results that they want. It's exactly how traders think about their strategy and their ability to follow the strategy that will set them apart. 
if making money is your goal and 90% of traders lose, then that just means about 90% of traders think analysis and strategies are the key to trading profits. So one question I have for you is, what makes you different than the rest of the 90% of traders that don't make money? I mean, really ask yourself that, challenge your thinking. If you really want to increase your odds at winning at this game before risking your hard-earned money, like what makes you different than everyone else? Or what makes you different than everyone else that is really successful in their real jobs or real career or school, whatever it is, but for whatever it is, they're just not successful traders. Like, what's What makes you different versus everyone else? And that's an honest question that we all have to ask ourselves over time. You know, it's, so we all go through it. We're all naturally smart human beings over time. And it's, this game is really hard. It just doesn't care. So some questions on that, like when the market's trending lower or higher, on a higher or shorter time frame, it could be whatever, a weekly chart, a daily chart, a five minute chart, an hourly chart. Do you have a tendency to try to find the bottom or top of the move? You know, over time, losing traders, they tend to distrust their current trend and they take positions against it. And from an emotional standpoint, the market appears cheap or expensive. Oftentimes this is caused when this trader thinks that every small counter move against the primary trend is the start of a new trend and they want to catch the bottom. You know, they want to, they just want to, or they want to catch the top and think they're going to make a home run on it. Well, traders that make money, they're actually a lot more trusting of the current trend. And this attitude makes a big difference between the winning trader and the losing trader. A winning trader is not attached to the idea of cheap or expensive. He or she is just focused in the present moment, right now, on the current price. If the market's trending, he or she trusts this trend and can unemotionally join the trend without their ego feeling uncomfortable. In other words, the winning trader believes in trading with the trend, not against it. For this case, I know that might sound one-sided because there are also reversal trades when things get too extreme. Eventually trends end and they reverse and a new trend develops. But for this, in this case, I'm mostly referring to those people that are just going to try to just pick a top or bottom and oversize build their accounts thinking that they can get a quick reversal. More than not, it's really difficult to just pick the exact top and the exact bottom. It's, more, it's a lot more probabilistic to catch a trend and, and follow along with that trend. Or perhaps let's say you're currently trading with the trend, but you took a loss yesterday. Maybe today you might have a position that makes back the loss and some more. You might feel the urge to take profits quickly today because you made back yesterday's losses and you're turning a profit. It's like, hey, yesterday I lost 1R. Uh, today I'm up 1R, or I'm up 1.5R on this trade. You might just take that profit immediately only to see that trade go 3, 4, or 5R in your favor. And you're just sitting there kicking yourself because you botched the trade. And that happens. Uh, but to solve that, you really just have to identify, go back to that self-reflection, what, what caused it. And in this case, this trader, their experience is just focused on trading yesterday's outcome or trading that previous trade that they lost on and they just want to get back to even. This trader isn't present in the now. This trader has an emotional imbalance that's leading to a quote-unquote predictable outcome from what that trader experienced yesterday or the previous trade. And as a result of this emotional imbalance, this trader is not seeing the market as it is. This trader is seeing the market as he or she is. Because he or she feels this way, they're putting their emotions on the market, saying, well, I feel this way, and this is what, they're just, their trading charts are literally a result of how they're feeling. Like if you ever see someone just take a profit really, way too quick, it's because they're feeling like at unease. They're, they're, they're at unease right now, they're uncomfortable. More than likely, unless this trade has a system in place and it's said to take profits and that happens. But for 90% of people, that's how, this is how they think. And they have to change that. They have to be more systematic. They have to write out, reason, literally, like write out reasons to cover a short position or sell a long position and be much more systematic and objective towards this and let go of the previous outcome. Because every trade is new. It's a new trade. It's a new trade uh, based on the specific set of variables or trades that are within that setup for you. Let's talk about resilience and mental toughness. So resilience, this is the ability to cover quickly from setbacks, you know, illness, change, or misfortune, like buoyancy. It's also the property of a material that enables it to resume to its original shape or position after being bent, stretched, or compressed. Like think about like elasticity. Resilience, it's a psychological and emotional quality that refers to an individual's ability to bounce back from adversity 
and adapt to challenging situations and recover from setbacks or difficult experiences. Resilient people are better equipped to cope with stress, adversity, trauma, or significant life changes and emerge from these experiences stronger and more capable. Now, some key aspects to being resilient, adaptability. Resilient individuals can adapt to changing circumstances and adjust their strategies when faced with challenges. They're open to new approaches and can be flexible in their thinking. Second part to resilience, these people, they have emotional regula regulation. They have the capacity to manage and regulate one's emotions effectively. This includes recognizing and accepting emotions, but also knowing how to cope with negative feelings in a healthy way. Optimism. Resilient people, they tend to maintain a positive outlook even in difficult times. They believe in their ability to overcome challenges and view setbacks as temporary rather than insurmountable. Like any setback, it's nothing that this person can't not achieve. Like they're capable of doing it. It's just how fast can they solve that challenge? This person, they have strong problem solving skills. It's often associated with effective problem solving and decision making. Resilient individuals are often resourceful and can find practical solutions to the problems they encounter. Resilient people have a strong support system. Social support, that's a significant factor in resilience. Like having a network of friends, family, or mentors who can provide emotional support and guidance, they can absolutely enhance one's ability to bounce back from adversity. And this is especially important as traders. You know, if like you just experience like a negative day, you know, talk to go talk to someone in a positive mood. Like find find someone that's winning on the day, or just speak to a positive person in general. Get your mind off whatever negative emotions you're feeling, because we don't want we don't want to mix those negative emotions with our hard-earned capital. You know, we we want to just, just go talk to someone positive and, and really just find a strong support system where someone can just lift you back up and, and really get away from the, that negativity. That that can really help you be a lot more resilient. Like whenever like you just maybe you feel like really like fixated on like a really good trade idea maybe you did a lot of research on it and you're just, you're just feeling you don't you don't want your you don't want to feel unconfident because that this trade isn't working out yeah, we, we really have to separate our trading from our life and this one way that helps that a ton is, is a strong support system you know, get, get get find something to, to decompress from the market and that'll also allow you to be a little bit more objective you'll be able to just review the market in a new way. You might see it from a new lens. Maybe you're in that current moment, you're feeling negative, you're feeling like upset that you're losing money, whatever it is, you're, you're feeling all these negative emotions. Well, just by taking a step back, even for a few hours or a day or two, just to go out, spend some time with some friends, uh, play some games, whatever it is, whatever it is that helps you decompress, just by doing that, that alone can just get you back into a happy state so when you come back to that trade idea or that setup or that position that you have you, you see it a different way it's like huh it's going this way and you might be able to navigate it a little bit better you might see something that you haven't seen and that's where that strong support system can help resilience self-confidence resilience this is often tied to like resilient people they're, they're self-confident in themselves and this is the belief in one's own abilities. Like a strong sense of self-confidence can help individuals face challenges with greater assurance. Coping strategies. That's resilient people. They have healthy coping mechanisms to deal with stress and adversity. Another way to decompress this can be exercise. It can be mindfulness. It can be seeking professional help or engaging in creative outlets. Going on hikes. Activity. Whatever it is, just find that thing that can help you decompress and just find joy in, in, in that and just cope with it. Like just if you see something negative, go find something positive and continue to do more positive things until you're out of that negative headspace. Resilient people, they have a sense of purpose. This is really just writing out your why, like having a clear sense or defining like what's giving you meaning in your life right now, that can help bolster resilience. You know, because when you have like a strong why and you understand why you're doing like if you have a really there's a saying like if there's if you could if you have a really strong why, you could overcome any how. I think that's really important of about understanding why you do what you do because that's going to help you overcome anything that comes your way no matter how dark it gets, how bad it gets. If you have a really strong why and strong purpose, you're going to be able to persevere through whatever is thrown at you. you know, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And that starts with having a strong sense of purpose. And one way that you can develop that is just write out a lot of pain. Like what if, if you're experiencing a lot of pain right now, write out everything that you're painful on is really use that pain as like a, as a motivator. Yeah, pain, it could be, it's a temper, it's like what you'll notice is 
So you're like these short terms of uh, the, the, all the pain that would, if you're writing out the pain, whatever it is, uh, over time you're gonna outgrow that and that pain is gonna go away because you're evolving as an individual. So you could use it as like a cheap motivating factor, like cheap, cheap uh, motivation factors to propel you into the next direction. Or if you're more materialistic, whatever it is, just find, find that sense of purpose that can help you get through those, uh, those difficult times if you're going through that. Learn resilience. This is not solely an inborn trait, but it can be learned and developed over time through experiences, personal growth, and coping strategies. This is really important as trading. There's gonna be so many times in the market where things don't go your way. You might you might get top ticked in a stock and it goes right in in your favor immediately. It's like that that's gonna happen. It really, really there's gonna be so many. You might you might work like three months in the market, have a have a consistent down period for like a full up month. And then you don't see money again until month two or three because your strategy is not paying. That's that's time to learn. Maybe the market's slow, whatever it is. You're just, you're, over time, as a trader, you're going to learn how to uh, go through these experiences. There's um, resilience. There's many different contexts of it. It can be applied in various areas of life, like personal, professional, academic. And you can be resilient in one area of your life, but you can be facing challenges in others. You know? So really just be aware of the different angles it can be. But as traders, you know, we're, we will experience many forms of setbacks, changes, and misfortune. And during these experiences, you may question yourself why you're trading. You may have worked so hard to grow your account the last six to 12 months, only to give it back all in one week or a trade. You may be questioning yourself, like, why are you trading right now? That's okay. We've all been there at some point in some time. If you really want to become that trader that you want to be, this is part of that resilience. You know, this is part of the game. You know, this is it's just really understanding yourself. Like you understand every little nasty quality about yourself because your charts are a direct reflection of how you feel and like what you perceive. And that's totally okay. We've all been there. And as long as you're growth minded and you put in the work, you're, you're a hard worker, good chance you can get out of it. So I'll share a few training experiences of mine, both the good and the bad to give you an idea of, uh, this is a small, like when I say really small, this is like a sliver of uh, resilience of, of what this is. You know, there's so many things that I, I could share with this, but if, if I did it, this video would probably be, I don't know, like four, eight, ten hours plus. You know? So I just want to share at least one thing that I think can uh, resonate with other people. So 2016 through early 2019, I was an on and off trader. I was boom and bust. I'd make a little bit of money. I'd give it back. It's where I was just developing, going through courses, I was reading books, just chatting with other traders, seeing what, what are they doing that's working. And early November 2020, I started making a consistent five-figure income monthly. As a, I took like a remote sales job to fund up a trading account during COVID. And I don't really have much time to trade during the U.S. Open. So I started to focus on swing trades. And my strategy at the time was to look for volatility contraction patterns, VCPs. Basically, all I do is I just want to buy the second or third lower high, target a breakout above the highs or all-time highs, and then set a trailing stop versus the 20 and 50 EMAs. And at the time, the market was hot, and I had a string of winners. So as I was winning, the, my confidence began to grow, and I wanted to get bigger and bigger. However, I didn't have experience scaling with size at the time. Position sizing, that was a new skill set I had to learn. So for me, like I was fear, like I think I researched so much because I was fearful of not losing my money. So what happened was, I began researching the next home run trade. I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna go all in on something, and I want to be damn certain it's gonna. I, I want to be pretty confident that this thing is gonna work. So I literally spent like two plus weeks just nonstop researching. As soon as I wake up, the first thing I'm checking out is this cryptocurrency BNB, like uh, the Binance coin BNB. At the time, this is what I was just so like focused on understanding. And at the time, it was, from what I understood, it was undervalued at an average price of $29 per coin. And at the time my research, the all-time high was $39. That fit the bucket for a VCP, at least for what I was looking for. It was like, hey, it's starting to consolidate. There's higher lows below that all-time high. As long as there's a news catalyst that could come out, it could probably influence people to push it over that price. And they were just three months out from releasing their new Binance Smart Chain. And this was supposed to, like at the time, this was perceived to process Ethereum's transactions 
uh, at a faster pace. I don't know the exact data. I believe at the time Ethereum was doing like 1.2 million transactions either. I don't know how, like if that was per day or if that was per hour. I, I don't know the exact time, but BSC, they were posting screenshots of them being able to match that or do a slightly bit better. So what I started to do, knowing that BNB, since they were comparing, they were competing against Ethereum at the time, at least what I perceived it as, I then compared Ethereum's 2017 price movement to what BNB's price movement may have the potential to do in 2021 as they launched their new network for their new catalyst. Well, when I looked at the chart, Ethereum ran from 40 bucks to 440 or so within a span of several months. They went from, I believe it was a $4 billion market cap up to 40, 40 billion or so the span of several months. And the main difference that BNB had that Ethereum didn't is BNB implemented a quarterly burn that would reduce the supply of BNB every quarter until BNB had a total supply of 100 million coins. Ethereum didn't do that. And for everyone who's crypto here, you can see that's what the Ethereum uh, 2.0 is, EIP 1559 or whatever it's called, where you could stake Ethereum in every transaction, whatever, whatever they do for the burning thing. That's what Ethereum just recently did. So BNB, this in mind, at the time, they, they were ahead of the curve on this. So for me, I believe that BNB may have the potential to gain market share a lot quicker and perform an identical move like Ethereum did in 2017. And after completing my research, I went long all in BNB, $30.51, about 1,500 shares. That was my whole $45,800. $800 account or so in net worth at the time. And to me, that was like literally every dollar I had. Like that was, every, I was all in. I was like, I'm like all in. And this made me very uncomfortable. And in this moment, I was experiencing all these emotions. And in the upcoming videos, we'll talk a little bit more about fear, greed, and uncertainty and everything. But for this specific scenario, this would be the first big money home run I'd ever hit or miss. And in this case, as you'll see, I actually missed it. And I was so pissed. So this is the BNB chart. Uh, at the time, you could see, uh, you see the all-time high here, 2017. Pulls back, I don't know if this, this is 2017, 20, I forget the exact year when this happened, but market pulls back. It's a higher low over here on a weekly chart. Rallies up, starts to coil up over here. And it was right around this time over here where I started buying it. I was like, I believe I was buying it like, Right around here, I think I bought it on this, this green day, and then it pulled back over here, right along those EMAs, and yeah, here's the chart. Yeah, so the, I started going long here, like right around like thirty dollars and fifty cents for like the breakout. I get I get faked out over here, pretty much stopped out like right around thirty dot thirty. Took like a twenty cent loss, and then I re long down here, like maybe I never really know what I was doing. Uh, pulls back, and then uh, re bought it. We bought it over here, but I don't think I took a stop. I was like, dude, like, I got really pissed when it rallied back up. So, like, I think I got stubborn. And what happened here is I started to break out again. And right around here, uh, this is like a triple top. I just pretty much like stopped out after I saw like these two red candles, because I was fearing that it would come down to like 27 or 28. And the market just shook me out. You could see like these moving averages. I, I didn't even follow like this the trailing thing. I just stopped out because I was so fearful. It's like I have my whole account in this right now. It was already down here at 27, 28. And I started playing these mind games with myself. I started like talking myself out of this trade. You know, this has been like really realized here. This is like this first entry. This is end of November. Read long. This is early December. And this is mid, almost end of December. I've been in this trade for nearly six weeks now. And it's still just, I mean, for me, like I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm all in. I didn't see like, like I was just like, afraid on it and I shook myself out and what happens is coming into the new year you see that the market just starts ripping and for me this is where I just talk myself out of it and I just I didn't want to pay higher at a strong anchoring bias towards that 30 not 30 30 out five level I was like man I just had the best price I don't want to pay higher and um, this to me I just had the wrong beliefs as a trader I wasn't I didn't fully deserve this home run yet like yeah I, I didn't really des I didn't understand how to size into it I didn't understand how to add into it yeah, this to me this is a huge like huge 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 miss for me and i did not touch this thing <laughs> to me as a trader it's just this this has really killed me like just seeing this go nuts do exactly what i was planning and i just missed this entire move only missed it i think like the total uh, this, this was like over a half million dollar trade i would 
I missed out on. And that was just because I over, I, I over leveraged myself. I, I wasn't comfortable with trading with that amount of money. I, I should have just, I should have just played less size and held for a bigger move in hindsight. But to me, there, there's so many things that went wrong with this, with me psychologically on this, that this left life-changing money on the table for me at the time. But because I missed that, I just really, you know, I really just reset myself for a little bit. You know, like after seeing something like this, you know, I remember if you were like, if you really like look back at like the Ethereum 2017, 2018, all the macros, like the, the leaders, they ran first, and then we went into like an altcoin season where these cheap alts start going nuts. And for me, as mad as I was about this, uh, it took me some time. It, this took me a little, probably a couple months, maybe like three to six months to really, like really fully overcome it. Because that whole year, I'm like, damn, I, I could have been like, could have had this much money, I could have had this much money. Damn, if only I held this, if only I had this. I had all these negative thoughts in my head. It really took me a lot of time to overcome this. But one way that I did it, I started to just think about, well, I missed this, but what happened when Ethereum ran? The idea was on Ethereum. It was like, well, if, if BNB is going to do Ethereum with, with their BSC chain, well, that's going to probably mean that there's going to be a lot of altcoins coming out of the BSC chain. It's going to be BSC altcoins. You probably think, what the hell is that? Well, in Ethereum uh, 2017, well, on the Ethereum network, there's ERC-20 tokens. So if you want to build on the Ethereum chain, you use an ERC-20 token. Well, in, 2020, in 2017 or so, there was just only a handful of those that were being built. And all of them went nuts because there was only a, a handful of them. And for me, I was like, huh, BSC is probably going to have a bunch of those. You know, there's only going to be a handful of BSC altcoins that are going to be getting launched here. And that's exactly what happened. You know, like the BSC altcoins, they started going nuts, uh, which I'll get into here in a few. But uh, ultimately what happened here was uh, after this loss, I put a few thousand bucks into a, uh, into a trading account on KuCoin. And uh, I was just trading like that simple, just... In this case, this was just, I was just buying like a, a trend reversal. It breaks out above these recent highs. I see a higher low forming. Uh, there's a news catalyst for some new platform. I forget at the time. Some YouTubers were talking about it. Uh, for me, I pretty much flipped like 5,000 to a little over 20,000 in, in about a month. Just by capturing this trend, follow my rules to the tick. I promised myself that I would uh, exactly what I... Exactly. I, I want to do the opposite of what I did here. I want to stay patient and let a winner ride. And this turned out to be the top. Literally, I, this was after this, this, this thing went down, I think, to like five cents. You know, so to me, this was a great trade. And uh, I just followed the rules on that. And then what happened is I took that, I think it was like 24,000 or so, either 20, 21 or 24,000. I then put that into a futures account into XRP. Uh, I grinded that. I was just scalped this range right here. You see, like how it came into like this previous support and that was like resistance. Well, I was just like scalping these ranges. Like you can see that, that like this high. Well, that was playing as resistance here. So right around like a dollar oh six to a dollar thirteen, I'd just be scalping. Uh, KuCoin they have five x leverage. So with the twenty thousand, I was just scalping fifty thousand to hundred thousand XRP at this time, just scalping for a few cents. And uh, over this, uh, right around like this period over here, this is right around like. I flipped that 21, 24 to just about 45,000 ish. And then I stopped trading that. And I started to just talk inside of the altcoin community for BSC. Uh, a lot of my altcoin trading friends, they were talking about everyone who's been in crypto and for like the 2020, 2021 phase. You remember Dogecoin? That thing went nuts. Uh, one of these coins, uh, there was actually a launch called this Doge Dash meme coin that was pretty hot, is popping. And part of my idea with the BSC narrative on how BSC coins pump, this was the first Doge Dash, at least one of the first on the BSC chain. Everything else was on ERC, like Ethereum. So for me, I was like, this is a really big opportunity. The CEO, they docked themselves. He was some, he was a popular guy on TV. And so for me, I was like, okay, this is this has all the this has all the variables of what a big winner might be. Let me let me start in here and let's see what we can do on here. And this, I started buying it down here, uh, ran this whole thing like ran up and it pulled back here. And uh, if, if just going through my analysis, actually I actually have all this on video through from start to finish on us before and after. Uh, the, but if you compare their market cap to the Doge market cap, Doge was like 20 some or 40 some billion. Their next runner up, like Floki or something like that, I forget the name exactly, but they were like 3 billion. This thing was only valued at like 10 million. So in my head, I'm like, these guys could probably reach. You know, like 10 percent of that maybe 100 million or 300 million or something like that so when it ran up from like 10 to like 80 million or something like that and pulled back i was actually buying more i started adding to this winning position 
and uh, I didn't I didn't I didn't add here I didn't I didn't dollar cost average on these dips what I waited for since I bought it so low down here is I want to wait for the bottom to be set in and then I started buying on these dips I started buying here I started buying here I started buying here and I got my average to just about like right here right around here so that way if this trade was wrong I just stop out for that's about break even on it so it turned out to just, I want to de-risk my trade I want to be in a winning position and this this data just told me like hey dude if we're not going to come down here this tells me that, that a lot of people are accumulating this. And with crypto, you can actually see how many wallet addresses are accumulating a token. And this, this token, their address, it was constantly getting accumulated. Uh, they, they went from like a few hundred addresses to a few thousand, uh, all the way up to about 100,000 plus uh, addresses during this consolidation, or like along the way. And to me, I was like, dude, people are, like, people are buying this thing. They just need one big news announcement. It's going to go nuts. And that's what happened. They started getting listed on exchanges and went nuts. And to me, this was a this was part of this was part of my seven figure run. A big percentage of this just ran through the roof. And uh, was, I waited almost a year for that. You know, nearly just about a year. You look at this this first entry in November 2020, 2020. This was like November December or October November December 2021. You know, it took it took almost a year for me to find a new opportunity like that. And yeah, the market was hot at the time, but this is what it takes in terms of being resilient as a trader. You know, I got, you know, you hang around the barber shop long enough, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut. So, just really ask yourself, do you really want to be a winning trader? Like, how badly do you want it? Are you willing to evolve yourself? A losing trader isn't willing to evolve and won't seek guidance from winning traders. They won't take responsibility for their actions and will often blame the market or others for their lack of success. He or she, they may have hopes of making money, but their actions aren't aligning with their words. The results directly reflect their effort. And winning traders, they work hard and take responsibility for their actions. And we treat this as a profession. Now, I was thinking, like, even though I missed this big trade opportunity, I was thinking in years, I'm doing this for a career. So even though I messed up this, this year, next year I freaking smoked it. And every single year I want to get better and better and better. Like this this trade, this a small blip on the screen. You know, because I'm just so long-term focused for what I want to do with this craft. So if you decide you want to become a winning trader, one of the first emotional obstacles you'll have to overcome is understand pain. And as humans, our brain is primed to avoid us from experiencing pain. In trading, a losing trade is often associated with pain. What happens is our brain starts, like when we experience pain, our brain starts to create a selection bias towards avoiding trade setups that may not work. Just like how I, like just like that BNB example, I had so much pain towards that setup not working that I missed the whole move because I was afraid. I, my brain was in so much pain that I was very selective with it. It took a little, it took six months or six, six weeks or eight, eight weeks for that thing to even move and I got shooken out of it because I was, I was afraid of pain. This led to me and as well as other traders, this can lead to other traders feeling FOMO or regret after seeing one of these trades work favorably after the fact. And above, that's a great example of my own experience. And trading, it can be very subjective. We don't need to be right too often to make a good living from trading. Your objective should be to find a trading style that resonates with you, who you are, and what you like to do. Okay, so I'll cover patience in, a, in the next video. Hope you enjoyed this one.